Um, so this code, this talk's going to be quite code heavy, and as you can see, the projectors are a little bit tricky to read, so the code for this talk is all there. So if you've got a phone or you've got a laptop with you and you're having trouble reading the code, it's all on there. Or you can read it afterwards, however you like. Um, so asynchronous is kind of a bit of a buzzword, especially in the last kind of few, you know, five or ten years. Like, you have to be doing everything asynchronously. You know, it's all about asynchronously, asynchronous and concurrency. You know, every week somebody has somebody announces a new high-performance asynchronous event-based framework of some kind. You know, you have to be involved in this stuff. Um, so this talk's actually going to be quite basic. We're going to go right back to basics. Um, and in fact, a lot of the code that we start with is going to be the sort of code you might actually write with C and not C++. Um, and we'll try and sort of walk through how we got to where we are now. Um, so there's about 10 parts to this. Um, I'm going to give everyone a chance at the end of every section for questions. Um, and we're going to go through various methods that you might have used to do concurrency or asynchronous programming in C++. Um, so, a bit of background about myself to start with. I'm a system software engineer. I do mostly C, C++, and nowadays quite a lot of Python. Um, I come from, come from Bristol. I've um, been living here for about 10 years. Um, you'll probably know and love Bristol. But it is officially the best place to live in the UK because the internet says so. <coughs> it must be true. Um, so this is actually an article the BBC put out a few uh, last month. Um, the interesting thing about this is the quote at the bottom, which is a little bit tongue in cheek. The cool, classy, supremely creative city beat off stiff competition to the top of the list. And I just kind of thought that was funny. Um, right. So, uh, as I said, I've spent most of my career doing systems development, and the first thing I worked on was this uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet switch. Um, it was mainly focused on very high performance uh, networking. Um, there's a single chip in the middle of that box that can process a terabit of data a second, which is a nice big number. Um, and the, after that, I moved on to working on databases, um, SQL databases. Um, so all of the work that I've ever done has been to do with I.O. in some way, and therefore a lot to do with concurrency as well. Um, you can't really... With, the whole point of a database is to give you access to disks and storage in a sane manner and networking switches. Obviously, their job is to move data around. So I really haven't been able to avoid this stuff. Um, at the moment, I'm working with a company doing something completely different, um, doing consultancy for OpenStack. Don't worry, this talk is not going to be anything to do with OpenStack, so don't get too worried about that. Um, so we're working with University of Cambridge at the moment, helping them deploy HPC systems using OpenStack. Um, and that system at the moment is deployed. We deployed it last year. It's currently being used for uh, medical research, in particular uh, brain image processing. So for those who don't know anything about OpenStack, it's a, the buzzword kind of answer to what it is, is it's a cloud orchestration platform. So if you want your own AWS in the corner of your building, you can use this to do it. Um, and I like to say that it's a complex distributed application to run your complex distributed applications. So if you have to maintain one of these things, well, good luck, basically. Um, one thing that we're particularly focused on is monitoring. Um, and this is actually where it gets a bit more interesting, because this becomes a, a sort of a data collection, storage, and analysis problem. And you want to do it with as little hardware as possible. So if you've got a cluster of 1,000 machines, people do not want to take two or three of those machines and use them to monitor the other machines. In the HPC world, people want every last CPU working at 100% all the time. Um, so to do this data collection efficiently is actually quite a big deal. Um, and it actually becomes quite, a, as I say, a sort of a database problem more than anything else. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about my background. So this talk's mainly going to be about I.O., um, input and output. Um, and 
What's interesting about I.O. is the trade-offs you encounter when you're dealing with it. I mean, you could sort of apply these to any software, really, but these are the things that I'm usually thinking about when I'm writing software, which is heavily I.O. based. Um, so performance, this is, you know, everybody loves performance. If you're doing C++, you probably care about performance in some degree or another. Um, speed, so just the raw speed of your code. If you've got some processing to do, you've got you know, a gigabyte of data that needs processing. You know, we're, we often care about really how fast you can do that, you know, how exciting we can make the instructions to do that. Um, other aspects of performance, footprint, so the amount of memory you use quite important. Um, utilization is one that we don't often think about. And that becomes very important when you're talking about concurrency and I.O. So it's all very well your code executing, it's processing very fast, but if your CPU then sits idle, then you're actually wasting resources that could be doing processing. Um, we're going to come on to that quite a lot throughout this talk. Um, scalability, so you know, you've got a gigabyte of data, you've now got a terabyte. How does your software scale to deal with that? Complexity. So I think this is, I think in C and C++, it wasn't always considered very important. Like it's got to go fast at any cost. I think now we're starting to realize that doesn't really work with humans. And there's been a lot of talks this week about how to make your code more readable, more maintainable, um, how you can reason about it better. Um, and what constructs are you going to use that introduces the risk of making your software break? Um, so that's something that's quite important. Uh, um, and on a sort of a different angle to that, but somewhat related, Software has to be testable, and I think we've all agreed that this is okay now. Like, it's okay to think about designing your software that you can test it, even if that does have to be traded off against some performance, or even some readability. Um, and with testability, we're often thinking about, we're thinking, we're thinking about achieving correctness, um, but we want determinism, reproducibility, and we want to be able to isolate our code so we can test it bit by bit. So all of these things we want to think about, and these aren't specific to I.O. or concurrency-heavy software. It's kind of quite general, um, but it's worth thinking about. Um, the one I'm going to focus on, as I said, is utilization, and this is kind of key. Um, so if you have a software program that doesn't do any I.O., all it does is it's a function that takes some data and calculates some new data, then you're lucky. Um, because it's very easy. So we, we're going to focus on CPU utilization. So I've got this little graph here, sort of thing that you might you know, get out of some monitoring system, your CPU usage over time. So our example program is going to be quite simple. It's going to do two tasks, one after another, on a single CPU. So CPU usage will spike to do the first task. And we'll spike again to do the second task. And maybe it does a bit of something else in the middle. So we quite often use the total runtime as a gauge of performance. And this is quite often the thing people care about. How long does my data take to process? If you want to make this program any faster, then you're really limited to just optimizing how those tasks execute on your CPU. Um, making better use of memory or caches or fewer CPU instructions, all the things that C++ programmers love to agonize about. Um, now let's imagine a slightly different program with some I.O. in it. So now what our task has to do is before it can actually do its processing, it's got to go and fetch some data from somewhere. Yeah. So that might be from a disk or might be from a network. And it might take quite a long time. So we have to do a little bit of work to start that operation going. But then we have to wait a while. And then we can actually do the processing. And then our second task comes along. We start that going. 
have to wait for the data to become available from a disk or something. And then we can process it. Very common. So our runtime. Look at all this CPU time. It's just wasted. It's doing nothing. Ideally, we want to do something in there, make better use of our hardware. And this is, this is what we talk about when we mean utilization. Here, we've only utilized the CPU part of the time through our task. So what if we were to do this instead? Once we've started our first task, what if we then start a second task? And then we can be waiting for that data to come back while we're waiting for the other data to come back and even while we've started processing. What we can then do is we can then start doing that processing a lot sooner. And this quite simple change actually means that we can decrease our runtime of our software quite considerably, more so than you might actually expect. And we haven't done anything to make these tasks run any faster. They're running the same speed as they were before. It's just that we're now overlapping these operations, these slow op operations that we don't have a lot of control over. So this isn't necessarily parallelism. So we're not doing any work in parallel here. Yeah. Some of the I.O. is happening in parallel, but as far as the CPU is concerned, there's nothing in parallel on the CPU. We're doing one thing after another. So this is concurrency. So we've got two tasks and they're kind of executing, not in parallel, but kind of interleaved with one another. And we're doing this so we can get better utilization of the CPU. So this is what I'm gonna focus on for most of this talk is single CPU performance. Um, using parallelism, using multiple CPUs to improve performance of IO heavy software is really a whole talk in itself. So we're gonna keep it simple. So we have a desire for concurrency. We want utilization. We want our CPUs at 100% all the time so we get the best performance. The problem is this is the root of much, if not all of the complexity you'll encounter when writing concurrent asynchronous code. In particular, in regards to code readability, you can really end up with some horrible looking code. The order of the events in your program are no longer serialized. So you can no longer read your code and say, I call this function and this function and actually expect them to happen one after another if you've got some asynchronous operation in between. We want our code to at least read serially. So we want to be able to read the code and say, this happens, and then when this happens, something else happens. So we can treat it like, like we've treated procedural code. And so yeah, given an event like a disk read completing, we're able to read the code that will be executed as a consequence of that shortly afterwards. That's kind of the ideal, so our code doesn't look too dissimilar from sequential code. It isn't as simple as it sounds, of course, otherwise there wouldn't be a 90 minute talk about it. So, testability. So, reproducible testing is hard. I.O. is often unpredictable. You don't have any control over it. If you're fetching some data from a website or from a server on the other side of the world, it could be down, the network could be down, the network could be slow. Anything can happen. Now, the logic of your code can often be tested by mocking out all of the external interactions. And we usually refer to that as unit testing. But we still need to test the external interactions. So when we actually plug it into an external resource, um, we still need to test that, that actually works. And we often call that integration testing. So we can't completely hide the problem behind mocking. And concurrency just makes this even harder. So the events, we're now saying we want to execute events in different orders to they're potentially written in the code. Should we exhaustively test each path? So if we have 
you know, three events, there's a huge number of combinations in the order in which they can occur. And do we have to test all of those? And that's quite, that's a combinatorial problem. The number of paths you have to test grows quite rapidly. Or we're going to set up something representative, maybe factor the code down into a component part and test that, and maybe test two events happening in different orders and say that's good enough. So this is all things we're going to have to think about. So an example problem for us to think about. We're going to focus on network I.O., because it's most prevalent, and at this point, it's quite well explored, quite well trodden territory. Asynchronous disk I.O. is quite a contentious topic. Um, I spent five years trying to work out the right way to do it, and I still don't know, so I'm not the right person to ask about it. Um, a lot of people disagree on the correct way to do it. Um, if you look at the kind of history of development in the Linux kernel, there are asynchronous I.O. interfaces for reading and writing disks. And there are people that tell you, you should not use them, and you should do it a different way. Um, so, very confusing. So we're also going to use uh, local socket connections rather than actual networks, because we're not really interested in TCP. We're not interested in the overheads that brings. We're interested in the mechanisms to achieve concurrency and as asynchronous operations. And so these uh, Unix sockets, as they're called on Linux and other operating systems, they're just very cheap, very lightweight um, networking primitives that you can only use on a single server. And our basic example is going to be a little more than a lookup table. You can think of it as the world's simplest database, if you like. Not a very useful database, but... So we're going to have a server. It's going to have some data. It's going to be in memory because we're not going to worry about disks today, and we want to share this data between multiple clients. They ask for a key, and we send them back a value. Nothing particularly exciting. And importantly, we're going to have no requests to actually modify any data. So really simplifying it here. So we're interested in performance. So we're going to test the performance of these examples as we try out these different mechanisms. And we're interested in how many operations per second we can do and how many concurrent operations we can do. So if you've got lots of clients, you want to handle as many as possible. And you want to let them do as many operations, many requests as possible to your data. Um, so we're going to, we're going to run tests that do 50,000 connections one after another, and each time we do a connection, we're going to do 10 requests and then disconnect. So quite a typical database scenario or web server scenario. And we're going to vary the number of concurrent connections so we can test how much concurrency we can achieve with each of these methods. And we're going to vary it from one connection at a time, so no concurrency at all, up to 50,000 at a time. Uh, so there's some supporting code for this, as I mentioned before. There's a little uh, net library. Don't use it. It's for educational purposes. Uh, it's basically a load of wrappers around system calls, so we can write some C++ code rather than horrible C code. Um, it is quite useful for exploring these concepts, though. So they're very lightweight wrappers around operating system concepts. They don't really add anything. If you go and look at the code, they just fall through to... C calls. So our first uh, little bit of code is a socket class. I'm sure at least half of you have actually written this in the past. Uh, you know, it's a socket. It wraps a file descriptor. And you can send stuff on it. Um, so it just wraps C functions. So listen and accept. So these are two things we'll see in a minute about how we can accept connections from the outside world and send receive. And I've made this absolutely simple. So all we can do with this socket is send a string and receive a string. And if the connection is closed, we won't get a string. 
couple of helper functions to actually create these sockets. So on the server side, we can choose to bind a socket to a local path or to a TCP port, which will start listening for us. Um, and as I said before, we're using local sockets to, for lower overhead. And a couple of functions for the client as well. So the ability to create connected sockets, connect to TCP and connect to local. So last chance if you want to read the code, there's a link. So first bit of code, we're going to write our example program in a blocking way. So main, emitted all the headers, by the way. All this code does work if you get it off GitHub. It's been cropped down somewhat for the slides. Um, so we create our little table resource. This is just a class with a single function called lookup. You give it a string, it gives you back a string. So this is our database. This is our in-memory high-performance database. Um, so to start listening, we create a socket. And the way local sockets work is they're actually a path on the file system. So we just call our socket socket. And we start listening on it. We then start looping. So we can accept connections forever. And we accept a connection. So that will block until something connects to us. And then we loop and receive messages until it disconnects. So when receive returns nothing, we know that it's disconnected. Look up the value we receive. And then we send the result back. So the quest comes in, find the answer, send it back. Simplest client-server interaction there is. So the performance of this thing, our first performance measurements. So with one concurrent connection, so I guess you can't really call that a concurrent connection, one connection, um, we can manage with our little test program 190,000 requests per second. So that's our baseline for this entire talk. That's kind of what we're aiming for. You can't really make this code any simpler to do what it does. Unfortunately, if we try and have any more than one connection, our execution time is infinite. It doesn't actually work. You can't actually get any concurrency with this code. It's kind of given away in the title because it's called blocking. And what's happening is here. So we've accepted a connection. And this function call will just wait forever until some data comes in. If in that time another connection arrives and wants to get some data, tough, can't do it. It's just going to sit there forever. So not doing too well so far. Uh, so that's our scalability of this, uh, this code. Starts off, starts off promising, a nice big number, you know. It'll impress people. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, not good. I realize this line's a little bit misleading because really it, it should go down right after two, but yeah. So what's good about this? It's simple. I mean, I think it's fairly easy to understand what's going on there. This is almost like pseudocode with auto. I mean, there's no types or anything. It's great. Um, it's quite easy to work out what's going on. We accept a connection, we receive a message, we do a thing, we do a thing. One thing after another. Clear in order. It's probably as efficient as you can get. Um, maybe if you wrote the C yourself, there's very minor improvements you could make around certain system calls. Um, but you're really going to struggle. I mean, there's not much noise in here. Um, if our lookup was any was costly at all, then perhaps we could optimize that. Um, but again, that's a different issue. So just wrap system calls. So we can test this fairly easily. We have to do a bit of work, but we can mock out a lot of this I/O. So we can mock out bind. We can create a mock socket, and the mock socket has an accept and a receive function, and we can tell the mock to return messages and. We do the lookups and we check that the mock gets the right message back. So I'm pretty confident we could write a pretty good unit test for this code. And of course, you know, we'd obviously want to factor some of this out as well. So we'd have a, this would be a function. So obviously it's bad. 
you can only handle one connection. It's not very useful. Although if you only need to handle one connection, this is not such a bad way to go. So the CPU's idle a lot. We're not very good getting very good utilization. So we're spending a lot of time waiting for this receive to finish. And it's quite flexible. So what if we wanted to have a second listener? If we wanted a second socket, or let's say we wanted our software to handle local socket and TCP sockets. We can't just add another loop at the bottom here and say, start accepting, because as we've already found, we're just stuck in this receive loop. So it's quite inflexible to what we can actually do with it. So this brings us on to the next one. So has anyone got any questions at this point before we move on? Anyone? Really happy? Good. Um, so select. Anyone used select before? Either in C? Yeah, OK. So you kind of know where this is going then. Um, so select was available since Linux 2.0. I mean, it's been available since I've been capable of programming um, around 1996. So 20 years this has been in operating systems as a concept. You know, it might have been in other systems before that. Uh, it's quite a simple concept. So it has this abstraction called an FD set. Of course, I've made it look a lot nicer. The C code and the system calls for this, as some of you who put your hands up will know, is a lot nastier. Um, but conceptually, it's a set of sockets. And it's actually a bit set, I believe. Um, and each bit represents a file descriptor as an integer. So a file descriptor is um, the thing that is behind a socket. So when you see file descriptor, think socket for this talk. And what select does is you give it the FD set, and it will clear the bits for sockets which are not ready. So for data that isn't, sockets that don't have any data available, it will clear the bit for you. And then what you can do is you can test the bit which you're interested in to see if any data is ready. So what this means is you can have lots of sockets. You'd say select with all these sockets, and it will tell you which ones are ready. You can then go and receive data from each of those sockets. Code's getting a bit complicated, though. And this is after we've wrapped it in some C++ helper functions. So um, we're going to split it into two halves, a bit of setup at the top, and then the handling of the connections at the bottom. So the first half of this, uh, we do the same setup as we did before. So we create our table, create a socket, and we start listening on it. We then have to hold on to some state. So each time we, because we've now got multiple connections, because that's kind of the whole point of doing this, we can store them each in a, in a vector. We can argue later whether that's a good way to make a vector in C++11 or not. I kind of like it. Don't judge me. Um, we then create this FD set um, thing. And what we want to do is in this FD set, we want to maintain a set of the file descriptors that we're interested in events from. So we're interested in accepts or receiving messages from. And then we start this new concept for the first time, an event loop. So we're looping forever. But we're not looping in the same way as we did before. We're looping so that we can select from this FD set. And from that, we'll get the set of FDs which are ready. So the set of sockets that have data waiting on them. So having got that set, we can now check it. And we can ask the FD set, uh, is our socket, listener socket, readable? And if it is, then we can do the accept. And we can store the socket for later. And then we add that extra socket we just got to the FD set. So next time we go around this loop, it will actually be checking whether the socket that's connected has any data ready. Um, now, we have to go through all of our connections, and we have to ask the FD set, is, uh, is each of them ready? And if it is, then we've got the same code as before in the blocking code. So we receive some data, do the lookup and send the result. 
if we didn't get anything back from there, then we have to do a bit of cleanup. Um, and we have to handle this horrible case of deleting while in a loop from a vector. Of course, you should have extracted all of this out into an algorithm of some sort. But this is mainly for show. So, performance of this thing. Uh, one connection, 160,000. It's, it's a bit lower than our blocking code, but I guess you can expect that. We've got some extra system calls in there. We've got all this extra state to sort of mess around with. So, maybe we can forgive it. And it does actually handle multiple connections concurrently. So, if we try and make five connections at a time, then the performance is a bit worse, but it's, it's working. Yeah, it's miles ahead of the blocking code. But then we get to a thousand connections at a time. And our request per second has tanked to 9.6. That's, that's, that's kind of bad. Um, anyone any idea of what happens after a thousand? Yes? Yes, it uh, doesn't work. <laughs> um, and as your man at the front here rightly pointed out, the amount of sockets or file descriptors you can put in one of these sets is limited at compile time a long, long, long time ago. Um, and you can go and look at what the value is in, in a header file somewhere. So there is an alternative to select which you can use, and it's called poll. I'm not going to talk about it because, unfortunately, although you can get over a thousand sockets concurrently in there, it suffers from the same scaling issues. Um, so you're still going to get that kind of fall off there. But then, do you really want to go further than a thousand if a thousand is that bad? Maybe not. Um, so select actually scales a bit, and then less well. And as I said before, if we did perhaps if we did look at poll, then uh, well, yeah, it's not going to look good, is it? Yeah. But we have achieved some concurrency, so we're doing better, um, much better than blocking. <coughs> so what's good about this? Multiple concurrent connections. It's quite efficient if you don't have too many. Um, but that's about it. I mean, this code's horrible. The control flow is all over the place. It looks nothing like our blocking code. It's not very easy to follow what's going on. We've got this extra state management to worry about. And the performance is kind of awful when it scales. So it's not looking good for select. Um, so luckily, there's another way. There's a few. Any questions at this point? No? Good. You're all obviously um, nice and sedated from lunch, so that's good. So threading, people love threads, they're fast. Um, available since Linux 2.0, they were made a lot better in Linux 2.6 from what I can read. Um, So they've been around sort of a similar amount of time. Um, they're in C++ since 2011, so that's good. We finally caught up. Um, and you can use them a bit like this. So C++ has done the wrapping for us. The operating system has an ability to spawn a thread, and it will start running some code for you. Kind of simply put, you can run a function, and it will run asynchronously. And what this means is, this function here that we're using to spawn off some work will actually return, and you can carry on doing other work, and what you passed in as this functor will run somewhere else. And the operating system takes care of the magic to make that happen, and there's quite a lot of magic in there. Um, so the CPU time, given that we've got one CPU, the operating system is going to let us, going to share it between our two threads, so it's going to run a bit of this thread and a bit of the other thread and it switches between them. Interestingly, it will even do it if your function is blocked for some reason. So in that receive we had earlier that was just blocked waiting for data, the operating system actually is even a bit cleverer when it comes to that, and it will say, oh look, you're waiting on me. The kernel was actually the thing blocking your progress, 
and it will say, I'll do something else. So, very promising. So the code for this, same bit of setup again, create a listening socket. Um, we create a new thread to accept connections. For this simple case, we don't necessarily have to do that, but I'm kind of trying to show how you would use this, in particular if you had more complex stuff going on down here. So we create a thread to do our accepting. We then create a thread for each new connection we get. And that's because this receive is the part that we're blocking in. So when we're blocked here, we want a separate thread to carry on doing the work for us somewhere else. And then, because this is just an example, we just pause forever and the kernel just <coughs> then goes off, puts off that main thread to sleep. But conceptually, you could go and do some more stuff here. So if we compare this code to the blocking code that we had earlier, um, it's almost identical. We've got this extra bit of code in here. We're using these code to spawn some threads. And with move, we can just shove our listener socket into our listener thread, and our connection just gets shoved straight into the, into the thread. And it's all managed for us nicely. So performance, that's quite a good number. Almost as good as blocking, actually. So there's a little bit of overhead. We've lost about 10,000 requests per second here. And it's likely to be due to this. So each time, so we're doing 50,000 connections over the lifetime of our entire run. So we have to spawn 50,000 threads potentially. Um, and that's likely where the creating a thread is not free. The operating system has to do some work. So we can forgive it. It's a bit better than select, which of course went right the way down to 160. So. Uh, and actually, we can go all the way up to 10,000 connections. So right at the bottom here, we've spawned 10,000 threads. Um, this is on my laptop, by the way, so not fancy in any way. Um, and the performance is it's at least in double digits when we get all the way down here. So that's pretty good. Um, the, the reason you're seeing a bit of a drop off here is going to be because you do have essentially 10,000 versions of this code, or at least the state required for this code. So the stack and all the registers. And the operating system's busy moving all this state. So it's got one CPU, and it's context switching all the time just to do tiny bits of work. Um, so it's not free. I mean, there is cost in there. Ah. 50,000 connections, which means we need 50,000 threads. Uh, resource temporarily unavailable. That's a shame. So this limit actually depends on the operating system. There's no compile time constant that's stopping us doing this one. Um, and in fact, you could even get above 50,000 uh, if you had enough memory and you configured your OS accordingly. But if the OS by default on my laptop is telling me 50,000 threads is a bad idea and the performance is starting to tail off, then maybe this isn't the right way to go. Maybe we shouldn't push that boundary too far. Um, so actually, scalability, it's not too bad. We've got all the way to 10,000. It's um, sort of halved the performance as we've scaled, but it could be a lot worse. Definitely a lot better than select. So that's good. Not only have we got further, but we've maintained better performance as we've had more concurrency as well. So what's good about this? Multiple connections, concurrency. Code's good, it's readable. We didn't add very much. It looks a lot like the blocking code. And the request handling is reasonably efficient. It tails off, but it's, it's pretty good. 
um, and it's flexible as well. So as I mentioned before, because we've made this other blocking operation accept have its own thread, we could have another server down the bottom here. We can have multiple servers, have a TCP server as well. Um, so that's good. So what's bad about this? There's one very important keyword on this in this code. Very, very, very important. And if it's not there, this whole thing is not going to work. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Pardon? Uh, the opposite of that? The const up there. <laughs> so notice that. Our shared state there is const, and we're sharing it between threads. You've probably heard in other talks that this is bad. This is a bad idea. So our state, our shared state, must be thread safe. And that's the number one problem with this code. It's very easy to introduce race conditions. We wanted to add a insert operation so our server can take new data as well as give you back data. Take that const away. Yeah. Oh dear. So testing threads is kind of hard. And you've probably been told this a few times this week already. Exhaustively testing all the combinations in which threads can run is, is near impossible. Some people claim that you can do it, but I think we've kind of agreed that it's not possible. And that's because the OS is taking full control, and it can really tell us that you know, the code that we're running, you know, if you imagine all this code is you know, instructions, then the OS can start each thread executing at any one of the instructions. There's no exact points in which each thread will, which each bit of code will occur after another. I mean, the combinations are huge. So testing this is going to be quite hard. The thread creation, as we mentioned before, hurts performance. And the context switching hurts performance as well. So that's not good. Um, any questions? Spot on. So ePoll. Uh, anyone heard of ePoll? Uh, few hands, less hands, so that's good. Some of you might learn something. Um, so if you're using other operating systems or kernels, then you might know KQ. And I think I'm stretching my knowledge here, but I think there's a similar thing on Windows called IOCP, IO completion ports, which kind of perform a similar role. So um, if you're thinking, if you're on one of these platforms, kind of just grep, grep that out and think of those instead. They're sort of fundamentally the same. Um, so this was added to Linux in that around 2003. So it came after Select had already been available for a long time. And it came after that a lot of work had been put into making threads better. So remember we said threading was available, let's say, around 96. And they made it a lot better in 2002. So this came after that. So people had already been working on making threads really good, in Linux at least, for quite some time. And then they still decided to do this. So ePoll is a kernel resource. And it's kind of similar to that FD set we had before, in that it represents a set of FDs, uh, file descriptors, sorry, um, sockets. So you can add sockets to it. You can remove them. And this is actually in the kernel, and that's an important distinction. So this isn't a bit of memory in your code. This is a kernel resource. There's system calls that to create this thing. There's system calls to add a socket to it, and system calls to remove from it as well. And you specify it by file descriptor. Um, and if you're not used to FD, again, just think socket. But the important distinction here is it actually tells us so again, this is just wrap, these are just wrappers around system calls. So you can go and look these system calls up. I think they're called epoll add, epoll del, and epoll wait. Maybe there isn't a del one. Epoll modify or something like that. Um, but this wait function actually tells us which file descriptor is ready. So it's not giving us a whole set of file descriptors. 
and say, uh, work it out yourself. Well, we've done something, work it out. It's actually telling us. And this is really important. So it tells us specifically which sockets are ready. So our code, again, not readable on the slide, so not good enough. It's a little bit shorter than the select code. And we'll split it into two halves. We'll look at the setup, and then we'll look at the handling of the events. So same setup. Create our poll um, object instance. We add our listener to it. So we want to know when new connections are made. So we add that socket to this magical device. And then we start looping. And then we ask the operating system to wait for us and tell us what's ready. And it will dutifully tell us the file descriptor <coughs> of the next socket that becomes ready. So we need a little bit of extra state for this. So like we, like we did before with select, we have to remember that we've got these sockets. Um, but what we want to do is we want to be able to, because this is telling us which file descriptor is ready, we're going to use a map so that once we get told this connection's ready, we can easily go and grab the socket. Um, and we can argue afterwards whether unordered map's the right thing to do that. But I think it's a good start. So it's not completely straightforward. Still a bit of fiddling around. So we first check whether the file descriptor we got was our listener. If it was, then we know we can accept a connection. We'll add it to the set, and we'll store the connection, the socket, for later on. So similar conceptually to the select, except we've got a map. Um, otherwise, we're going to assume, because the only things we put in there into this set of sockets are the listener socket and all the connection sockets, we can assume if it's not that one, then it has to be one of our connections. So we can look it up in our map, and we've got our socket back straight away. The lack of for loop in there might be hinting something to you. So we receive the message, look it up, send it back, blah de blah de blah Is the connection closed? Yep, fine, then we delete it, clean up. Kind of conceptually the same. So the performance of this 160, that sounds familiar. Oh, that's in the wrong order. OK, I thought there was select there. My mistake. So select was managing with one concurrent connection about 160,000 requests per second. Threading, um, EPOL manages about the same. Where we compare it to threading is kind of interesting, because as you see, we've got that drop off. So we've gone from 180,000 to 160-ish. Um, but look what happens when we get to 5 and when we get to 10. The number of requests we're actually being able to manage per second actually gets better. I don't quite know why that is, but it's definitely as good. Whereas with the threading, it's really starting to fall off. And this keeps going. 50,000 connections, 50,000 concurrent connections all sending 10 requests each at this little server. And we've only lost 5,000 per second. That sounds pretty good. So this is kind of related to a concept you might have heard of, um, and that's called C10K. And it was this kind of problem that I think it was originally with web servers, and that web servers wanted to start handling lots of connections when the internet was getting big. And there was a problem with handling more than 10,000 connections. And EPAR was one of the things that kind of came out of that you know, area of work. Um, and it's really solved it for us, so that's pretty good. And the key to it is this. So the operating system is telling us which of those connections is ready. 
We don't have to, we don't have 50,000 things we have to go and inspect one by one. Yeah. And then that operation there is nice and cheap as well. So we go straight to our connection, receive the message, and just get on, start again, going through the loop. It's even in green, that, wasn't, that was an accident. It wasn't in purposefully in green, but it came out uh, like that. So yeah, we've got some scaling here, and it's, it's looking pretty flat, so that's good. We can handle as many requests with one connection as we can with 50,000. So this thing's good, this thing's really good. It's a lot better than any of these. These didn't even get to the finish. So, what's good about this? Concurrent connections. It's single-threaded. So we don't have any race conditions. We don't actually have to do anything with this state. If we made this table, we took that const away, made some modifying operations, it actually just work. We won't have any problems. That's quite important, I think. Scales efficiently. What's bad about it? Well, the control flow is still not great. It's still, if it's easier to follow than select, and you could, you could possibly refactor it so this connection handler was in a, was in a function so you, it would look a bit readable, a bit more readable, but it's certainly not as good as we started with, with the blocking code. It's not trivial to follow what's going on. So there's a lot of state in here that we have to manage. So we've got, these, uh, we've got this ePOL thing again. We've got this map. You know, it's, not as, it's certainly not horrible, but it's certainly not as simple as we started with where we, were just, we just accepted our socket, we passed it into the functor, and it just went on its way. So that's a shame. So, uh, any questions about ePoll before we go on? Yes? So, basically it tells you what socket you are free to read from. Is it fair to all the connections? Is it fair? Ah, yes, I was, uh, I was wondering if, you, if someone would uh, bring fairness up. So I have kind of overlooked fairness in this talk to really keep things simple. Um, but as I understand it, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, as it's, I guess the C++ way of, of responding to that would be it's implementation defined. Um, I'm going to guess that the Linux kernel has a good... Um, makes a good effort to sort of, you know, round robin between different connections. I'd be surprised if it wasn't, um, but don't take my word for that. Um. Uh, yes? For epoch, uh, epoch itself actually returns all the file descriptors that is ready. Yes. So uh, I guess you would have some speed up as well if you return all the file descriptors because then you would have fewer calls to the kernel. Yes, so um, this man here has. Yes, is also ah. <laughs> yes, so this man here has spotted another one of my simplifications today. So this wait function under the hood will actually return you um, a set of descriptors that are ready. So if more than one is ready, it will tell you actually all of these are ready. And as he rightly pointed out, that means you don't have to do as many system calls. So optimize a little bit. Yeah. I think the way the system call actually works is you won't, you have to give it, because it's a, a system call, you have to give it a fixed size buffer. And so if you've got, your buffer might be a thousand big, if you've got 2,000 ready, then it can't actually, you can't guarantee that it will tell you all of the sockets that are ready. So I'm, I guess it still has to do something about fairness there. Any other questions? Good. There's one other simplification with ePoll which hasn't been spotted, and we'll come on to that. Because that one's quite interesting. So callbacks. So callbacks aren't, so at the moment we've talked about features that are given to us by the operating system. Callbacks aren't a feature of an operating system. 
And people talk about callbacks, at least in an asynchronous I.O. concurrency context. They're really talking about the genre of library. Um, so you probably know some of these. Uh, Boost ASIO. Um, in Python land, you might have heard of Twisted, async I.O. In JavaScript, you've probably heard of Promises. Um, and there's even some, even some C libraries that actually do this as well. I mean, the concept of doing sort of callbacks in C, I don't really know if that makes your code any better or not, but um, subjective. So, and these kind of follow this event loop pattern that we've kind of seen. Um, and they, some, they sometimes referred to as having a reactor. I think ASIO now calls itself a proactor, and I can't tell you the difference between them, I'm afraid. You'll have to ask someone else. Um, but what they do is they wrap something the operating system provides you already. So some of them wrap select that we talked about, some of them wrap epoll um, or their equivalent. Um, nothing to do with threads. So they're wrapping these concurrency primitives the OS has given us. And this is really as kind of an effort to make the code better. Because manually, I've tried to make that code look as nice as possible by wrapping it in little C++ classes and you know, having things passed around by move semantics. But you really don't want to be thinking at that level when you're writing code, because you're thinking a lot about operating system specifics. It's not good. So all these libraries, they're kind of a way of hiding all of that. So, more epoll. So I showed you epoll having this sort of interface. So that's, that's a bit of a, a bit of a lie, because it's a bit more flexible than that. So when you add something to your epoll resource, you have to say which socket you want events from, but you can actually give it any old eight bytes that you like. And it is eight bytes, even on 32-bit systems, I think. Um, but that is good enough for a pointer. And that is the magic amount of memory you need to do anything. Maybe it could point to a functor. So instead of returning the file descriptor, it returns that pointer you gave it instead. It's kind of useful. And this lets you avoid the, the file descriptor lookup. It also makes your code a bit simpler as well. So in theory, we want to write callbacks like this. It'd be great if our code looked like this. So in our accept operation, we say, when accept is done, when it's finished, do this callback. And thanks to lambdas, we can even write it in line like this. In the past, we'd have had to define a function pass it in and all that, bind some arguments to it. And then we do the same with receive. So we receive, and on receive, when the receive is finished, do that. And I kind of imagined a library here where when a connection is accepted, it does the accept for you and it passes the connection in. And likewise with the receive, it gives you this string for you. And this is sort of fundamentally a very, very, very simplified version of what Boost ASIO gives you. It has a socket class, and it has async receive methods, and it has some extra stuff for ever handling, which again today we've just kind of swept under the rug. So this code compiles, but it will crash. And I don't expect you to find where, unless anyone has an idea where it crashes, because um, the code's a bit small on this projector, but the problem comes from this. So the connection here, we need it to do the receive, but then we need it, once the receive's finished, to send our result back. So what we've done is we've captured our connection by reference and passed it into the lambda. Unfortunately, this connection is just a function argument on the stack. And we've taken a reference to it. We've passed it into this callback. And this callback gets executed. 
someone in the future, the stack has already unwound. That connection is gone. So this doesn't work. But we can fix that. Uh, we could make our, we could change our socket and make it shareable in some way. Um, here, all I've done is I've wrapped it in a shared pointer. So we take our socket that we've passed in here, we've made a shared of it, and we use that instead. And we pass that connection in to the lambda instead of the original thing we got. And we don't have to pass it by reference. So the code doesn't crash anymore, but unfortunately it's still deficient. It still doesn't actually do what the other code we looked at does. So this code is only ever going to process one message, and it's only ever going to accept one connection. It's kind of obvious when you look at it. Where's the for loop? In the blocking code, there was a for loop around these things, or I think that was a, the receive might have been a while loop, and the accept was a, like a for loop with a couple of semicolons in it. So, yeah, not good. So we could do this. It's getting a bit more fun now. The callbacks can sort of call themselves or can request that another function calls them. So we have to make our callbacks recursive. If you're starting to groan, you should be groaning at this point. Um, so because we need to do this receive function after we've done a send, we need to we need our callback to pass into receive, because when a receive happens again, we want this code to execute again, and therefore achieving our kind of loop. Um, and you can do this with lambdas if you, if you sort of fall onto std function, and you can do it by, you create your function, you take a reference to that function, you pass that in, and then you can use it there. And we have to do the same with the accept, because once we've done one accept, we want to accept another one. So yeah, pass the callbacks into themselves so that we can do another operation. Must be a reference, yeah. So this actually works for the on accept case. This is fine. But it crashes. Of course it crashes. So it crashes for the on receive case. And that's because we're capturing stack variables again. And it's here. It's in. So this callback we've defined here, and we have to define it here because we want to capture the connection. So we want to create a callback for us to happen when we've received a message that's specific to this connection. So we've passed our connection in. So we, it needs to be specific to each connection. But this is a stack. So this is inside a lambda. So this is on the stack. So I mean, you could change it to a shared pointer of a function to avoid of optional string. And then you could pass that in by shared pointer to there. And I guess it would work. But I'm starting to think this is kind of a bad thing. You know? And I think this might be a good rule to follow if you're doing some of this stuff. If you've got a lambda that executes asynchronously, so if, so the exa an example of a synchronous lambda, I don't know if this is common terminology, but it's a nice way to think about it. Um, so if you have a lambda you're passing to for each, it gets executed inside that for each function, but then never gets used once that function's returned. So you can capture things by reference, pass them in there, and that's fine if they've on the stack. But if it's asynchronous, then your lambda is gonna be, could be called anywhere in the future. So all the state that it needs needs to be bundled up with the lifetime of that lambda. So if you're doing asynchronous lambdas and reference captures, you're probably going to be sad. Um, usually, probably. Because, of course, sometimes it's work. But I kind of think if, if you... Yeah, I think if you kind of see that happening, if you're passing in something by reference to a lambda that's asynchronous, it's going to be executed. Someone in the future be very wary of what you're doing. Because as we saw there, it actually worked for one case, but it didn't work for the other. And that was just because that variable happened to live longer. 
So we finally have working code. Um, and the way I've chosen to do this is actually do it without lambdas. So we've got, you know, these might have been functions. In the past, you might have defined functions, and then you might have uh, used std bind to bind the arguments to them. Um, but I've just made these little structs. So they're little functors that do the on accept and on receive. So we've got a normal setup code. We run the event loop. Um, and the event loop in this case is, it's got EPO underneath. So we've added our callback alongside our socket and it's saying, now execute this callback. And we accept some connections and we pass in our accept functor. Our accept functor takes the state table in the socket, takes the, gets given the connection. We share the connection because we still need to do that. And we start the receive. We then start a new accept. And because this is already defined, it works. Um, the receive goes up here, stores the connection, does the receive, sends the, sends the result, does a new receive. Lovely. Notice what we did there, though. We read the code from the bottom to the top. Ugh. That's not very good. That's sort of the opposite of what we want to do. We want to, we're used to reading things, this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. Not this happens, and this happens, and this happens. That's not very nice. Um, and you have to do it like this. You can't define this functor afterwards. And as you saw, we tried our hardest to use lambdas, so we had all the code in line, and, uh, but it just didn't work. Not saying it couldn't be done, but you know, uh -huh. so performance. Uh, this may or may not be a surprise. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise. So the way this, the way these little functions are implemented, um, is using epoll under the hood. So there's nothing sort of fundamentally new going on at the OS level here. Epoll is we've said when this socket's ready, pass me back this pointer. That pointer was a pointer to a functor. When it says that, we execute the functor. And so we get similar performance to epoll within error. A bit of fluffing around there. It follows it almost to a T, which should be expected. So we get all the advantages of using epoll directly. Multiple connections, it's single threaded. No threads, yeah. No race conditions, efficient scaling. But it is a bit better than epoll. I mean, yeah, I kind of made a big deal about writing callbacks being a bit of a pain, but it's still, it's still a lot nicer than, I mean, there's no, epoll doesn't exist in this code. Um, it doesn't even have to be epoll. So I think Boost ASIO, for example, has options to use select or epoll, so it can support you know, very old kernel versions. So it's better, I would say. And there was some, there's some similarity to the blocking code. So you know, this sort of bit here is kind of similar, this bit's here similar. And if you kind of, you know, if you kind of imagine it constructed in the inverse, then it kind of looks a bit like blocking code. But it's not ideal. So our control flow is now inverted. So we're reading it top to bottom, bottom to top. Not good. Um, so the actions to follow an event have to be written before the initiating event action. Recursive callbacks, uh, not fun. There's a lot of, uh, we've got this extra, we've got shared pointers in here now because we've got this state to manage. This didn't exist in our blocking code or in our threading code. Let's not be too harsh to the threading code. And because we've got shared pointers, there is a risk of cycles here. Um, so I have experience working on large boost ASIO callback um, code bases. And if you have enough of these callbacks that take shared pointers to things, 
you will get cycles because you will eventually have an operation that depends on an operation that wants to use a different operation. It will happen. Unless you're a much, uh, much more diligent about your shared pointers than I am. When I think shared pointer, I kind of think, uh, make it work. Be done with correctness. So, a little bit of a diversion now onto futures. So I'm not going to do too much on futures. Um, and I'll explain why. So I kind of categorize two types of futures when people talk about futures. Sometimes people talk about futures in an event loop kind of context. So when they're talking about this, they probably mean things like JavaScript promises and Python deferred. And then I think of futures in more of a threading context. And when I'm thinking about that, I think more of um, C++ 11 futures and, and Java futures. So when I'm thinking about event loop style of future, they're basically just a bit of syntactic sugar around callbacks. So for example, in Twisted in Python, if you do an asynchronous operation, you get given back this deferred object, which for all intents and purposes is a future. And it has an operation to say, when it's finished, when this operation is finished, do this function. It's a callback. It's saying, run this callback when the operation is finished. And JavaScript promises are kind of the same. So they have a function, they call it dot then, and you might have heard of that before. And it says, when this operation is finished, when this future has finished, run some code. So subjectively, it makes your code a bit more readable because you can kind of think of a function as returning a value or a future to the value, and then you can say, when the value exists, do something. So it can make your code a bit nicer to read. And it can be especially useful if you're having to deal with exceptions because the future can um, store the exception if an exception gets thrown from your callback. Which again is something I've purposefully avoided today just for simplicity's sake. With this type of future, there aren't any threads here. Like to get a JavaScript promise or a Python deferred, you don't have to create threads. Um, in Twisted, you have an event loop. So you do get loop, run, something like that. And JavaScript, depending on where the JavaScript is running, whether it's in a browser or in like a server-side framework like Node, there's an event loop in there somewhere. But you don't have to create a thread to use these things. And this is how they differ to these. So there's a similar interface, so you can do the same thing with these, conceptually. Um, you should be able to do the same thing with std future, in that you can say, when this future has been resolved, do this code. Unfortunately, that wasn't deemed important enough, but you can get the value out of it and it will block. Um, C++11 has the blocking version. C++ question mark has the non-blocking version. 20, maybe, I think. Is it 17? No, I don't know. Doesn't matter. So this is useful when you've got threads because it gives you the necessary safety to return a value from one thread to another. So if anyone was at Kevlin Henney's talk yesterday, he made a really good point um, that a future is basically a concurrent queue that can only hold one thing. And that's a really good way to think about it. It's a method of passing data between threads primarily. And it has all the necessary synchronization in there for you to do that. So it's suitable for I.O. You certainly can use it. It provides much of the same thing. I mean, your event loop can resolve your future and your future can be then executed. You know, you've got some extra locking in there or some new texts perhaps, but it will work, but it's not necessary. You don't need that to actually do what we've talked about with the callbacks, because there's no threads in that code. It's all single threaded. So threads aren't actually required to do concurrent IO. That should be clear sort of by now. In fact, they're not even a good way to do it. And by extension, therefore, reaching for std future and std async might not be the most efficient way to do an asynchronous network operation. 
They're much better suited when you're trying to parallelize work with threads. So if you've got a thread pool, for example, or if you've got a piece of work that's processing a large amount of data and you want to do it twice as fast, say you use two threads because you want to use two CPU cores to make it faster, then using a future can be a good way to do that. So I still don't think the future in 11 is quite sufficient to do that. You can get some of the way, but you really need that non-blocking kind of equivalent so you can say, run this callback in the future. So, another buzzword at the moment, coroutines. There's a lot of talk about coroutines. Um, before we move on, any questions about future or disagreements about future? Excellent. Glad you all agree. So again, these are a concept. They're not a library or OS feature, necessarily. Some people call them user space threads. That might mean something to you, it might not. So they're cooperatively scheduled, and you have to schedule them yourself. So we talked earlier about the threads. The OS is sort of switching between your work for you. With coroutines, you kind of take that work on yourself. And there's a lot of confusing terminology around coroutines. I've probably used the wrong terminology here for the coroutines I'm going to describe. So people talk about stackful coroutines sometimes. Sometimes people talk about fibers. My understanding is these are roughly the same. Um, the programming model you use is slightly different. Stackless coroutines people often talk about as well. And again, as my understanding goes, mechanically these are like callbacks. So you define, it's kind of a programming model layered on top of callbacks that some languages support. Um, we'll come on to why stackful coroutines are interesting. Um, so this usually get, these are usually either part of a language or part of a library. They're nothing to do with the operating system. Operating systems can provide things like this, but all of that work is usually still done in user space. Um, so, for example, C Sharp, um, ECMAScript 7, Python 3.5 uh, language have coroutines in the language. If you want to use coroutines in C++, you can use Boost coroutine. That's what we're going to do. Um, and they're even in progress for C++ as well, although not 17. I really wish they were. <laughs> Or at least even in a technical specification, but it's not quite there yet. So this is the code that, this is the sort of code you can write if you're using coroutines. And it should immediately be looking familiar to you. So it's quite similar to the threading code. Accept connection, have a coroutine to receive messages for each connection. So very similar to the threads, and that's kind of how coroutines act. They sort of act a little bit like a thread. So you can have concurrent stacks of work going on at once. But they have an event loop. So, you, so this event loop here, and again, all the code is online if you want to look at how it actually sort of gets stuck together. But this, the event loop is the thing that's switching between these coroutines. So you've got all these coroutines, and this event loop is using epoll, and it's got all of its sockets in the epoll, and the epoll is saying, hey, now this thing is ready. And instead of passing the pointer to a callback in there, what we've done is we've passed a pointer to some coroutine state. So it's like a boost coroutine something something. Um, and what you actually get, you get this extra argument when you compare it to the threading code. So all of this is identical, except for this extra little thing in here. So we get past this thing called a, well, here I've called it yield. It's some internal type of boost. And you can call that, and you will get put onto the queue of work to do. And you can, and what we do is we pass the necessary state to epoll, 
so that when we ask ePoll which socket is ready, it actually gives us the state of that coroutine back, and that state we can use to jump back in to that coroutine. It's quite a lot to get your head around. Um, so if you're interested in it, go and look at the code. It might make more sense. Uh, but you can think of them like threads where you have control about which ones you jump between. And this is quite important. So if we compare it to the blocking code, kind of like when we compared the threading to the blocking, almost identical except for this extra, uh, these extra spawns and this extra yield. So performance, again, shouldn't be a surprise given what I've just said, because it's backed by, um, backed by ePoll. It scales nicely, nice and flat. Oh, that's a shame. It's not quite as good as if we were just using callbacks. So it's not free. There is some overhead in there. But it's still a lot better than threading. Even though, as we looked at the code, the code was almost identical. And of course, it's a lot better than the rest. So raw epoll and callbacks are still able to slightly outperform our coroutines. So what's good about them? So we get the advantages of threading to some degree. We get some concurrency. It's quite, the code is a lot more readable, I think, than the callback code. And it's a lot more flexible. Um, we get the advantages of callbacks. Performance scales better than threads when we scale the connections. We can avoid race conditions. There is no threading here. There is no race conditions. You can pass a mutable one of these into these coroutines. And there will never be any race conditions. That's super useful. There's none of that shared pointer stuff in here. There's no messing around with passing things by shared pointer and changing them. All of it is like the threads and like the blocking code. Move the connection into our coroutine. That is then stored on a stack specific for that coroutine. So what's bad about them? Well, the performance behind them is not quite as good as callbacks. It's close and it scales well, but we're C++ developers, so if there's performance to be had, we, we really want it. But there are a lot of advantages to these. So the mechanism, if you went and actually looked at the code that Boost is doing to give you this kind of threading abstraction that isn't threads, there's some really scary stuff in there. Like it's a lot of, there's a lot of assembly in there. You know, it's messing around with um, lots of register state and lots of stuff. You really don't want to be stuck debugging anything at that level. And it's non-standard as well, so it's a library implementation. There's no, you know, one coroutine library is very unlikely to be compatible with another coroutine library. Um, or code written using different coroutine libraries. You know, if you've, one team has written using boost coroutine and someone's used something else, they're never going to interact. So it involves this complex saving and restoring register state, which again is probably a whole talk on its own. So debugger support is quite sparse for these things. So if anyone's done any multi-threaded programming in anger, you probably have this etched into your brain, thread apply all BT. Because if you ever get a debug, if you ever get a, um, if you ever get a locked up threaded program, a deadlock, that's the first thing you're going to type to try and work out which thread is blocked and which and which and which. And you don't get that with coroutines, or at least these ones. But you could. There's no reason why you couldn't have coroutine apply or BT. And I really hope if we get C++ standard coroutines, then some debuggers will give us an ability to get a stack trace out of an individual coroutine. And then we have this problem where we've got this yield object. And we have to propagate it around. And from what I can gather, this is one of the contentious topics about the C++ standardization of 
coroutines. So the problem with this yield state is that you can't, you have to have a different function, version of your function, if you want to use it in a non coroutine context to a coroutine context. Um, so this is something that a lot of people are very upset about with Python 3.5 coroutines, is you have to have an async version and a non-async version of any function you want to use in both contexts. And sometimes the code can be identical. So we require a resumable or async version of all the functions. And I think there is an effort for people to point this out and to say, you know, we, we want it to be better than this. That's my understanding. So, summary. Oversimplified the entire talk for you, if you want to take a picture. Um, red, bad, green, good. So, blocking. If we write our code in a blocking way, it's really simple, really testable, but doesn't perform very well, unless you've only got one connection, and you only want one connection, and you don't want any concurrency. Um, but if you want it to scale and perform well for large numbers of connections or concurrency, then don't use blocking. Threading. People say threading's complicated, but the code that we used and we were looking at for the threading code was actually really simple when we compared it to the alternatives. But testing that code because of all the race conditions is going to be a nightmare. Um, and if you factor in the risk of accidentally introducing race conditions, then maybe the argument kind of for simplicity falls down dramatically. Um, and performance isn't actually that good. It doesn't scale linearly at all. Um, and we take a hit over the locking code. So select, <coughs> complete rubbish. Don't use select ever. There's no need to. Um, it's complex, it's hard to test, it performs like crap. EPOL, quite complex, still quite hard to test, but it's really fast. But don't use it. You should use um, callbacks or coroutines, potentially. So I'd argue that coroutines are a lot less complex when you're writing code than callbacks are. I think they're both probably on par when you come to test them. So in the past, I've written kind of a layers, layers on top of Boost ASIO, which let you control when callbacks are dispatched. Um, and that's actually quite good for testing, because you can really control which order your events occur in your, in your unit test. Um, so testing is, is tricky, but it's doable, and it can be deterministic and reproducible. Uh, performance of callbacks is still slightly better than coroutines, at least in the form of code I've written, which was using Boost coroutine. Maybe if, in the, maybe if they're built into the language and therefore in the compiler, the compiler can do a better job. Um, and then, of course, there's the argument for stackless coroutines, which, as we said briefly, are sort of more akin to callbacks. So, not a surprise. Doing it efficiently is the hard thing. If you want your IO-based code to be slow, then it can be really simple. Most software needs to do I.O. And this talk only scratches the surface of what you can do. There's lots of good material on this, though. The Boost documentation is actually really good. Um, lots of, I think the, the documentation actually forms a lot of the standardization proposals, which is interesting. The C++ standardization proposals is actually really interesting as well. There's a lot of information in there, if you want more. And of course, we've completely ignored disks. Conceptually, the, the same things you can apply to disks as well. Um, so it's kind of, if we were to give some advice, I don't really like giving advice because developers always disagree with each other. No one's going to agree with me. But I'll give some anyway, and I'll make it very vague advice. So keep it simple. There's some advice for you. Choose a model and use it consistently. So if you're using callbacks and you like ASIO, use it. Don't use some ASIO, some coroutines, bit of select, bit of epoll. Just use one thing consistently. Use an established library. 
Callbacks are okay. Just be careful with object lifetimes. It will really bite you. Coroutine's looking promising. Just be aware that there isn't, there is some magic going on, but under the hood, they're actually mechanically very similar to um, callbacks, and they're just wrapping primitives the operating system already provides. And potentially long wait for standardization. So if they're not standard now, I think maybe 20 if we're lucky. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you very much. <laughs>